It's great to have you here on the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. One decision you can save, do that will save you big money over time, buy a used car instead of new. Uh, you know the weird thing on that? There was a time during COVID that I said over and over again, I can't believe I'm saying this, but right now it's better to buy a new car than used. I've never said that in my life. And now I'm back to saying the traditional advice, used instead of new. We're going to talk that through. And later, boy, airlines continue to totally botch how to board people on airplanes. And United came up with this crazy system that just outraged people. And so now they're thinking, what do we do instead? And they're stepping up a brave face. The solution is so easy. We're going to talk about that. Actually, there's two solutions that would improve things so very much. Um, so right now, though, I have good news. I do have good news. Used vehicle prices, used car prices, had gone up, 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 and away. I mean, crazy numbers during the car shortage during COVID. And so much of the problem initially came from the parent company of Avis, the parent company of Hertz, and the parent company of Enterprise, that they, to try to survive the travel shutdown in 20, sold off all their fleets. And then people started traveling again, first slowly and then in big numbers, and there weren't any cars on the lot. And so the... Uh, enormous run-up in the value of used cars that happened in starting in the second half of 20, all the fault, all the fault of these three companies. Because then at the same time, we had supply chain disruptions that continued for a good long while. And ever since we hit that peak ugliness, the values kind of hovered for a while, and then gradually, almost like the decline of the Roman Empire, they uh, have been trending down. Not back to where they were in 19. How many different things can we say that about? But uh, COVID was really disruptive to the world economy in so many ways. And even though prices are dropping in many categories, they're moderating in others, we still have had to absorb these big increases. Well, now in the um, used car market, there's more and more vehicles that are getting cheaper and cheaper, particularly compared to a year ago. And there was a survey done by IC Cars, and the largest drop for any used car in the United States used was the Tesla Model 3 down 29% in price in one year, just as the new Tesla Model 3s are way cheaper now than they were even the beginning of this year. The BMW i3, down 18%. The Chevy Blazer, down, these are used ones, looking at three-year-old ones. Chevy Blazer, down 17%. BMW 2 Series, down 16%. And it goes on like that. Those are the ones with the most dramatic drops. But the prices have been going steadily down. They're not dropping like a rock. But you, when you add enough months in, like I just gave you with the Tesla, the BMW, the Chevy Blazer, significant drops in price when you accumulate the price drops over the months. And this is the leading edge of what's happening in the used car market. And the prices have gotten better. I told you before, and most people buy used cars, and that's where the emphasis of what I talk about should be. But I also talked about how the new car market, that supplies of new cars are back to historical numbers, almost exactly, which is a theoretical 60-day supply on dealer lots. There are particular models that are over a 100-day supply now on dealer lots. 
And this is the fault of the manufacturers. They kept living under the reality of what happened in 20 and 21, and they kept loading them up the most expensive versions of a car with the most options on a car, and they outpriced the market. The people who would pay the big bucks, they've already paid it. And so now we've got this big imbalance. And so there are going to be a number of vehicles now being sold well below on the new car lot, well below manufacturer suggested retail. Big price cuts required to move them. And so this is not the greatest era to buy a newer used car, but it is more normalized and the conditions are getting better. And I'm so excited to be able to report the decline in used car prices, which had been so unbelievably stubbornly high for so long. So good news for your wallet. Krista? Okay, well, speaking of cars, Broderick in Texas wrote in and he said, I need to buy a used SUV for my family. What is the best reliable used SUV to buy? So we have no price point? No price point. So let's go with Consumer Reports. Uh, the top SUV to buy uh, in their ratings is the Subaru Forester. And new, they're uh, pretty reasonable. And used, they would be a real deal, even though they do a pretty good job of holding book. In addition, if you want a bigger one, the Kia Tell Telluride, the Toyota Highlander, those are the top choices in an SUV. And if you're looking for family size, you're probably looking for the bigger ones like those two. And this is one of those times it is really important that you go research what Consumer Reports has found to be the most reliable SUVs, the ones that have the highest ratings. And gosh, the first three, Subaru, Subaru, Subaru. Mm -hmm have been the most reliable over time with the highest scores. Um, guess what the lowest is of any? I've never heard of this first one. 37 overall score mm. versus the Subarus have a score of 85, 84, and 83. The 37, the lowest rated score. Have you ever heard of this? The Volkswagen Taos? Yep. You've heard of that? Mm -hmm. And then another car I'm aware of, the, the Fiat 500, 500X. That's low as well. Yeah, yeah 38 on that one. So you want to get into the Consumer Reports, either the physical magazine, if you don't subscribe at a library branch, get access online digitally. You can research all the cars, all the SUVs in your case, and figure out what is that sweet spot a price point, quality, reliability for you in buying that used SUV. I mean, if you think about what did I say over the last two years? If you got one that's working, keep driving it. Now we're moving into a time that I'm moving away from that hard position. And there may be an opportunity for you to get a decent deal today. And I would definitely say the digital experience on this particular thing with Consumer Reports is definitely worth it because you can you can really narrow it down and it's just much better than trying to go find the... And I got to make sure I don't have a Clark Stinks. Many people have access digitally to their library system mm -hmm. and they're able to see the Consumer Reports auto information for free. Otherwise, you pay Consumer Reports either for a subscription or one-time use. Forrest in Ohio says, if I have accounts at two different credit unions that are insured with NCUA and both accounts have 250000 in them, if both credit unions go belly up at the same time, do I get $500,000 from NCUA or only two hundred and fifty k? The same question would apply if the money was in two different banks insured with the FDIC. So Forrest, first of all, that you have this kind of money is awesome. Mm -hmm. And your money is insured two fifty dollars by each institution. So you have 500000 under the National Credit Union Administration, um, and you have 500000 with FDIC. 
So you're good. You're secure. You're safe. And if you've got more than 500000 um, maybe there's a little more investing you should be doing than just saving. But good problems to have. Andy in New Mexico says, we cut the cord from Dish t Satellite TV and went to DirecTV Internet. DirecTV Internet does not offer music channels. What are the best options for music streaming services? So we have a guide at Clark.com of free music available online. Uh, my automatic is we start with where I listen, and that's first on our list, Pandora. I listen to the ads, and I have music for free. If you notice, on your smart TV, one of the icons will usually be Pandora, or you can download it and listen to all the free music you want with not an annoying number of ads. You build the list as you wish. iHeart, which is uh, historically the biggest radio station owner in the United States, has iHeart Radio, which has been a very successful streaming service. And we have a bunch of others on here that are available for free. Now, here's one that's not truly free, but Amazon Music, if you're a Prime member, you get Amazon Music for free. And you can build a list. And YouTube has become a big music source that's mm -hmm. available for free with the videos like... You think about the old days of uh, MTV, MTV, and what was the other one called? Um, it was for VH1. VH1. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that so was my day. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, uh, really, YouTube has become the modern MTV and VH1. VH1. And are they still around? Yeah. They MTV has. Yeah. They show movies. They do music awards. All sorts of stuff. See how much I know. I know <laughs> nothing about traditional TV. But we've got a long list. We, in fact, we have 14 different music services you can listen to for free on our article on Clark.com that was updated just this past summer. So good job on us having that. Coming up next, who's doing a terrible job? Oh my goodness. <laughs> the nation's airlines go out of their way to create upsetting, anxiety-producing moments at airport boarding gates. What in the world are they thinking? I'm going to tell you how I'm thinking, how I would fix it. That's straight ahead. Do you know what gate lice are? It's what they call all the people at an airport gate who are all jockeying for position and are so nervous they're never going to get on the plane. Even though they've got a seat assignment, a boarding pass, or whatever. And they hover, and it causes a lot of upset, and somebody will be in boarding group 44, and then somebody who's in boarding group 3 is trying to get by, but the person in group 44, they don't really have 44 groups, it just seems like it, is uh, blocking them, and kind of like people who block you on a sidewalk, they're blocking them, and they have to kind of push around and all this. I mean... Crazy chaos. So annoying. And then United uh, has been the big embarrassment lately, coming up with this new thing where instead of boarding uh, and all their groups, they're going to board um, from window first, middle second, aisle third. And the people in the aisle are like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hunger Games here. I'm never going to get a place to put my bag in the overhead bin because you clowns are saying... Even though I got status, I'm not going to be able to board till the last, and then there's no place for my bag and all that. All right, got two things going on here. First, market-based problem. Before this became the bright idea, first with the full fare lines, and it spread like a plague, and now nobody's better at ripping people off with this than like Spirit and frontier and all that they're both losing a lot of money by the way uh, it would be bad if they went away but man you treat people like dirt and look what happens anyway so why did this hunger game start with people going berserk at the gates and uh fighting it out for room to put their bag in the overhead bin why marketplace spoke the airlines in their wisdom decided, 
hey, look at this. We can make all kinds of money ripping people off on checking their bag. Isn't this brilliant? So then what did the marketplace do? Exactly what any economist would have told the brainiacs at American United and Delta. And now the other tweedly Ds and tweedly Dums doing the same dumb thing. People started cramming every last thing they could into what they call a carry-on and coming on with all kinds of stuff like they're evacuating from somewhere and bringing it on the plane to avoid the rip-off fees for checking a bag. And then the airlines are complaining that all the baggage fighting is now making their planes late for departure and taking much longer to unload the plane when it lands because everybody's having to grab their stuff out of the bin. And then you got to look out that somebody doesn't drop their bag and hit you on the head. Um, and so this is like totally, I mean, we should just sentence the three full fare airline executives to having to sit in a full semester of freshman economics. And they'll completely get it. Do you think you might be just a teensy weensy bit a part of this, encouraging people to never check their bags? Oh, of course I'm <laughs> part of the problem. All right, but I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not uh, done okay. with solutions. So anyway, what happened was airlines went from checking a boatload of bags and the planes being able to board more efficiently and get going more efficiently and unload more efficiently and all that to it taking an extra 15 to 20 minutes to board the planes and the poor flight attendants. Oh my, look at what is happening to the flight attendants. They're the ones who, because I think the CEO should all, that would be the second thing. After they finish their semester in freshman economics, the three CEOs should then be forced to work as a flight attendant for a semester. And then they'll see what their brainiac policies are creating, hurting the working conditions of their employees on those planes on the front line who have to deal with all this stuff. So it changed the balance because now you got everybody bringing on all the stuff. Then you got people like me saying, are you crazy? Are you gonna check a bag? Do you know what happens to those bags? Do you know they lose uh, one to three people's bags every flight on average? Why would you ever check a bag? Don't do it. You got to wait in line to check them. You got to wait to get them at that carousel. It goes round and round. Nothing comes up on it for a long time. So I'm obviously part of the problem. So I have a simple solution. Okay. You ever ride a subway? You've ridden a subway. Oh, yeah. Plenty. Okay. And then you think about a public bus or any kind of bus. How do you board a bus? A bus, you go and you go through the front door. And if you're at the beginning of a bus route in a big city and they're only boarding through that front door, it takes so long for everybody to get on the bus to get going. Subway, on the other hand, has door here, door here, door here, door here, door here. And everybody just goes on. You can board a thousand people on a subway train in the time that 10 people board a bus. Okay, so I'm not saying there was a crazy idea somebody wrote recently that the engineers just need to get going, figure out how to open up the whole side of the plane. Everybody goes on, then the side closes. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. But what do they do across Europe and Asia? Dun, dun, dun. Do you remember? Don't they board the, well, often they board the back of the plane first. The they front. board at least two boarding doors. Mm -hmm. They may use uh, what they call an air stair where you walk mm -hmm. upstairs. Yep. Um, Southwest and Burbank, where they're allowed to do this, boards from the front and the back. The planes board in one-fourth the time. One-fourth the time. So if the airlines want to play all these games with all the baggage stuff and charge all these fees and slow down all their fleet all through the day and complain and whine about how long the planes are on the ground, this is so simple. Just do what they've done everywhere else in the world and have more than one boarding door. If you go to the Middle East, 
oh my goodness, now I'm really going to upset the three Fulf Airline executives because they hate Etihad, Emirates, and Qatar. They hate those three airlines. Um, they have systems at their hubs where they board planes from as many as four doors. The planes board so calmly, so rapidly. I mean, the, the, the ability to fix this is there. You created the problem with all your ancillary baggage revenue. Now let's fix it. And uh, you know what? I will buy the CEO of Delta and American United. I'll buy them fares to Burbank. And I'll go show them, see, this is the right way you board a plane and you unload it and fix the problem. All right. Okay. You you're ready? looking at me like no, I'm crazy. No, I don't think you're crazy at all. All right. Well, I am crazy. questions. Crazy like a fox. <laughs> Alex in Pennsylvania says, I just recently found out that my soon to be 51 year old mother doesn't have health insurance. She works for a small business, so they do not provide it. I started to look around myself and most places say to go to healthcare.gov. Is this the best option? The premiums seem very high. Could you talk about how premiums are determined and what the healthcare landscape is like for people who don't get employer sponsored plans? So, when you go to healthcare.gov and you put in for the premiums, you'll see the choices on different color plans. And for most people, the sweet spot is the silver plan. And so, you go and look at the premiums for your 50 year old, 51 year old mom on a silver plan, and your eyes pop out of your head. But the thing is, that's not, that's the retail price. And very few people pay anywhere close to the retail price. Because unless your mom is making a zill where she works at this small business, she will qualify for much lower premiums. And there's a process where it calculates your real premium based on what the subsidy is based on her income. And I know this is crazy, but there are a lot of people who, will, who are not making a lot of money at a job who will put in uh, their particulars and they'll see this big premium and then they put in their income and their premium drops to uh, $0 or $20 a month or whatever. So go through the process at healthcare.gov. And I know, I already know we got Clark Stinks about this when I talked about it before. It's free for you because taxpayers are picking up, it's a subsidy of other people. So now I've said that. But go through it, and it is the best place to look at for your mom. Dave in North Carolina says, is Clark in favor of using any of the web services that, for a monthly fee, will supposedly remove your personal information from various people search websites? Not going to work. Um, it would be great if it worked. It works in other parts of the world. But we only have some state legislation. Some states have passed laws for what's known as the right to be forgotten. And then there's a pretty streamlined process to get your personal information removed. This is now uh, implementing in the state of California. And I forget, there were a handful of other states we talked about mm -hmm. that have adopted right to be forgotten laws. And really, we just need to follow the rest of the developed world with a uh, national standard, national statute that gives you the right to be forgotten and has streamlined procedures for doing so. But otherwise, any of these services, they may even mean well. It's just they're swimming up against a tide that they can't defeat. Kathy in Georgia says, I need to get some type of medical alert device for my husband. He is prone to falls and I work about an hour away from home. Do you have any recommendations or suggestions of what I should look for in a device? And Kathy, thank you for this. Our answer to this has changed. And now you want to look at either a Garmin device that monitors fall risk, an Apple watch, which will monitor fall risk, and certain Samsung watches that will monitor fall risk. I think also if you're Android, the new Pixel 2 watch may do so as well. We used to talk about various medical alert uh, things you'd wear around your neck, and if you had an emergency, you'd press a button. But now the technology exists that a simple watch on your husband's wrist, even if he can't communicate, it will, so the Google Pixel does it too. Thank you. 
So even if you were to, uh, your husband were to fall and he's unable to communicate, it will send an alert and will, in fact, uh, automatically bring, in theory, emergency medical to the address where he's fallen. Uh, that's why you don't see as much advertising for the old-fashioned medic alert things that people would wear around their necks because the technology is kind of leapfrogged and it's a free service, at least for now, of these various watch providers. So you got to make sure that whatever model you would get your husband actually has the fall risk available in it and that it's properly activated. And I'm trying to remember, am I speaking out of turn or am I right that uh, many of these, you can set them up to alert mm -hmm. key family members yes. as well. Mm -hmm. And the, like the Google Pixel one, you can click, I fell and need help, and it automatically does. And I think the Apple one's very similar. So, yeah. So this is a technology whose time has come and has pretty much made, not completely obsolete, but has really affected the market for the old-timey things that Saturday Night Live used to make fun of, their commercials. All right. So I want to thank you so much for your question about that. I can't even remember the last time we had a question about a medical alert, fall risk kind of thing. It's been a while, and these watches are becoming more and more useful, I think. And, I mean, Krista and I both wear them. I'm wearing two watches. Uh, one's a Garmin, one's a Samsung. And you have an Aura ring on. And I have an Aura ring. I just have a watch. My Aura ring's misbehaving it. I think it had a bad software update. It's having trouble <laughs> tracking my sleep and my overall health. Oh, well, enough about me. It is about you. So now it's time for today's Clarky. And who we have a Clarky from? Ross. Hi, this is Ross from Greenville, South Carolina. I just wanted to let you all know that I became a Clarky only this year in 2023. I had heard of Clark for such a long time, but just decided to take a listen one day. And I watch you guys on YouTube all the time. And it is nice to see like-minded people talking about the same things, things that I'm already doing. I really love the fact that Clark is anti-Zell. I send clips of Clark saying, do not use Zell to my parents all the time because they were using Zell for a while, and I agree and you agree that they should not be using Zell. So that is one of the main reasons that I am now a Clarky because it's helping communicating to friends and family that we should all not be using Zell. Uh, You're a good son, Ross. Yeah, Ross. Uh, Big Bad Zell is a broken, defective product that is harming so many individuals and so many families. The banks know how to fix it, but they won't because they don't want to spend the money to do it right. And they are putting their valuable customers, their money and their lives at risk Shame on the banks that promised, get this, it was a year ago, it was November of last year, that the banks promised on Capitol Hill that they would institute consumer protections by January of 23. It's now November of 23, and the banks have gone mute and just hoping that the problem will go away. Well, let me tell you, hurting your customers is not something that you can just wave away. And you're doing harm. You know, the first rule of medicine, do no harm. And the banks are harming people with big bad Zell. Do not use it. If it's activated, deactivate it. And I'll tell you that um, Cash App and Venmo, they've got work to do on consumer protections, but they don't have the embedded risk inside your bank accounts that Zelle has that makes it so much more a vulnerability for the bank's customers. And flat out, the banks don't care. Okay, so how many times have I picked on the banks already this week? It's been a lot. It's been a lot. Wow. Yeah, well, they're just, uh, maybe they're the perma Ebenezer Scrooge. <laughs> maybe they're just, they wake up every day, they think, how can we give a lump of coal to people every day of the year Instead of just Christmas Day, maybe that's their role in our lives. You're the anti-bankster. I am the anti-bankster. 
So I hope you've enjoyed today's podcast. Know that we serve you around the clock at Clark.com. And so relevant right now, ClarkDeals.com. As we lead you into the last weeks of the Christmas shopping season with the deals you need for up to the minute so you don't waste your money, you spend it as wisely as possible through the Christmas shopping season. Thank you very much. Have a great day.